going to take you back to where I started on this issue, um, which actually has um, only tangentially to do with uh, petroleum and uh, uh, other pressing energy issues. I began back in the early 1990s with the question, why do societies change? Why did we give up hunting and gathering to go to all the trouble of planting and tilling the ground and harvesting and all of that sort of thing? And, and how have societies evolved since then? Um, I looked for answers to this question, obviously in anthropology and archaeology, but also in, uh, um, in political history, economic history. And all of these were useful pieces to the puzzle. But then uh, in the mid-90s, I, I finally stumbled across a realization that in fact a, a lot of other uh, anthropologists had, had figured out earlier which is that energy is the key. Energy is what drives human societies, just as it's what drives all of nature. And as we, human beings, uh, exhausted our bioregions back in the days of hunting and gathering, as we got so good at killing large animals that we, uh, we basically hunted most of them to existence, we were forced, more or less, to adapt by developing horticulture, then agriculture, and these produced energy surpluses greater than what we had been able to do with hunting and gathering. That supported larger populations, but it also enabled us to create seasonal surpluses that we would store for hard times. But then, once we had food stored, then that created incentives for raiding and protection, uh, defense from raiding parties. You know, when we were hunters and gatherers, there was not much incentive for raids because nobody had very much. Uh, but once we, once we started having surpluses, then that created the need for specialization. You know, uh, some people could grow enough food to support not only themselves and their families, but also some other folks who didn't have to grow food. Now, usually it was a very small surplus, so that uh, uh, you know, maybe 80, 90 percent of people were still uh, subs basically subsistence farmers. And they supported a small specialist class consisting of managers, people who were keeping track of the surplus, and full-time specialists in viol violence in order to organize raids or defend against raids. We call them soldiers. And, uh, and kings and queens to sort of make all the decisions and, and keep the whole thing organized. Well, all of what, uh, everything I've described to you is basically a process of developing more energy in the sense of net energy, energy returned on energy invested. Now, with hunting and gathering, we were able to eke out about a 10 to 1 net energy profit ratio. For every unit of energy, that we expended in chasing down animals or finding roots or, and berries and so on. We got about 10 units of food energy in return. What did we use the surplus on? Singing and dancing, reproducing, doing all the things that are necessary to make a society work. With agriculture, we improved that energy, net energy capture somewhat. But with, with uh, industrialism, we basically, the, the system has gone haywire. <laughs> we have developed net energy sources so extraordinary that it's, it, it's a, enabled us to create a society in which maybe only 1% of us actually have to farm or produce energy directly in that sense, and all of the rest of us can sell real estate or flip hamburgers or uh, do all of these other things. The, this is the growth of the middle class. Now, going all the way back to the very beginning, what, it, what enabled this? A couple of things. Language, which enabled us to organize ourselves uh, over time and space to, uh, to coordinate our activities. That's how we developed the ability to hunt those big game animals. I mean, it, would you want to bring down a mammoth or a mastodon all by yourself? Uh, I wouldn't, but, you know, with a small band of other people and using tools 
this became possible and language and tool use leveraged each other uh, using language we were able to communicate to each other how to make better tools and we're still doing that and then we were able to use tools to extend the spread and power of language and we're doing that e to this day with cell phones and computers and all the rest so throughout this whole process of using language and t tools to increase our power over the environment, to increase the amount of energy we were, we were extracting from the environment, we went through several basic watershed periods. The adoption of fire, the development of agriculture, planting, uh, the domestication of traction animals, also human slavery was a, 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 a strategy for energy capture and the development, obviously, of ever more sophisticated tools to leverage energy capture. We think of, of the Industrial Revolution usually just in terms of the technology that we have developed over the last couple of hundred years. But in fact, I think a better way to think of the Industrial Revolution is the fossil fuel revolution, because that, that was at the heart of it all. First coal, then oil, natural gas, that's what made the Industrial Revolution possible. Yes, we had to develop the tools to be able to extract coal and then oil and to use these fuels. And in, in many cases, they were essentially the same tools. The steam engine originally developed as a mining technology to pump water out of coal mines, then became the, uh, the engine that ran the railroads to use coal for transportation. All of it comes from fossil fuels. And it has changed our society profoundly. Uh, this is a, a chart of the, uh, the work done in the United States according to the, uh, the, the source of the energy for that work. Back in 1850, which is the left-hand side of the graph, about 65% of the work being done in the US economy was being done by muscle power. And most of that muscle power was animal muscle power only about 18% was human labor, human muscle power. And then about 16 or 18% on the top is fuel-fed machinery. What was that fuel? Wood, because the US had a lot of wood. Now, <clears throat> over time, the contribution of muscle power dwindles to nothing. Why is that? People are still working, right? Well, the contribution of, of human labor as compared to the contribution of fuel-fed machines is insignificant. Maybe you've had the experience of running out of gas in your car and having to push your car to the side of the road. That's hard work, right? Well, try pushing your car 30 miles, which is what a single gallon of gasoline will do, if you, assuming you have a reasonably efficient car. Uh, that's basically six or eight weeks of hard human labor, pushing a car that far, the equivalent amount of work. So we're getting six or eight weeks of hard human labor, energy equivalent, for two bucks can't do that in China. So obviously we have mechanized everything we possibly could over the last 200 years. Now I, I mentioned at first the fuel that we were using was wood. Now by about 1885 we were beginning to exhaust our primeval forest on this continent and fortunately we had something else to turn to, coal. So around 1885 coal takes over as the primary uh, fuel source for the nation. Now this, this chart here is interesting because it shows renewable versus non-renewable energy in the US economy. Now this lower line here is renewable energy in the US economy. You may notice that it hasn't changed much since 1850. There's just about twice as much renewable energy in the US economy total today as there was in 1850. Meanwhile, all the enormous growth in energy consumption that we've experienced since that then has come in fossil fuels.